All right, we're in Philippians chapter 3, and the part of the passage we're going to focus in on this morning starts in verse number 13, where the Bible reads, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us, therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. Brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which walk so as you have us for an example. And, you know, our Christian life is is related to here and in, in another place as a race that we're running a race there's a prize to be won and actually that's in in first corinthians chapter 9 we're going to get there next but the apostle paul's right here he says i press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of god in christ jesus this isn't just talking about being saved because he's already saved. He's not pressing for and working for and trying to achieve salvation. He's already been born again. So this is telling us, hey, after you're saved, you don't just blow off the rest of your life and, and just live for the day of, as far as just let us eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. And, and you know That's not the way that the Christian life is supposed to be. It's supposed to be one of work, and it's supposed to be something that we have our eyes set on something, you know, on the eternal things, on heavenly things, and on what God has for us to do. So keeping all of this in mind, the, the, the subject matter that I want to be really delving into this morning is on the subject of having high standards. Having high standards, high standards for yourself, high standards in all manners in every area of your life. So just, just whatever you're doing, holding yourself to, first of all, having a standard Amen. where you can hold yourself to. And, and look, this isn't, this isn't to lift yourself up over anyone else. This is for yourself and for your own growth and to make sure that what you're doing is going to coincide with Scripture and the Bible and what God's expectations are of you. Because yes, God does have expectations of you. Think about it. Just because you're born again doesn't mean that it's like, okay, well, now you're in the family, so just go off and do whatever. That's ridiculous. Think about your own family. Think about, you know, I think about my kids. You know, yes, they're my kids. Yes, I'm always going to love them. They always have a place in my family. But that doesn't mean I don't have expectations for them. It doesn't mean that I don't have hopes for them and dreams for them and a path for them that I'd like to see them follow of being, uh, uh, you know, good people, people who love the Lord, people who are going to go and do something with their life and impact other people and actually have a big effect and that their existence is going to be much more meaningful than merely being a member of my family. We could say, well, I was a person's kid. So what? You know, what are, you, what are they going to do? I, I have expectations for them. And I have standards for them that I want them to follow to, to be able to, again, do more and, and be good people. God has standards for us. God has, God has commandments for us. God has rules for us. Amen. And we ought to use those commandments, those rules, to be our standards, to be our guidelines. And I think even let's just let's do all we can to have high standards. Because this goes above and beyond just is something sinful or not. And I'm going to be getting, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but there's a lot of things in the Bible. And look, if, if all you can do is just try to make sure that you're keeping yourself out of sin, amen, right? Let's, let's do that. But I want to push and press even higher. I want to press to have a, a mindset that not only wants to be able to follow the letter of the law, but follow the spirit of the law. So that we're, we're, we're understanding not just, oh, well, I can't do this because it would be a sin. It's, hey, this is God's law. If he says this is a sin, not only do I not want to do it, I want to keep myself as far away from this. I want to, or, or if it's something that I should be doing, you know, I want to do that as much as possible. You know, go ye therefore and preach the gospel of every creature. Well, if I don't do that, it's a sin. Yeah, it is a sin. If, you know, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. 
Okay, so we're not trying to find, well, what's the minimum I could get away with in my life and just make sure that I'm not guilty of a sin. We want to have higher standards than that so that we're saying, yeah, okay, we know that these are areas that God demands of us, but I want to far exceed those things as much as I can. That's the goal. That's the mindset. Look, I know we all fall short and come short, you know, we all... Uh, come short of the glory of God. I know that we're not perfect. I know for all of sin and come short of the glory of God. I get that. But that doesn't mean that we just say, well, just forget it all anyways then. Well, I'm just a sinner. I'm just going to go wallow in the mud. I'm going to go wallow in the mire and just, and just go ahead and just be a sinner then. No, of course not. Should we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Of course not. So we want to have high standards. I want to, I want to preach on this. I, I don't think we should settle for mediocrity as a Christian. And in your life, I, I don't think we should do that in any aspect of our life. But especially when it comes to observing the Bible and God's law, I think we should strive to be excellent in these areas. As Apostle Paul says here, he's like, you know, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I, I'm setting my sights real high. That's what I'm working towards. That's what I'm pushing towards. And one of the things that's going to help you, if you have your mind set on high things like that, and you want to win this high prize, and you want to live your life and end up with these great rewards that God will reward you with at the judgment seat of Christ, then you need to implement standards in your life to make sure you're not going down the wrong path and to keep you on the up and up. You know, we, we live in a day now, and it started, I think, way back even in my generation with the, you know, the participation trophies yeah. where you just, I, I know I got those every year. I was in team sports. I was on the swim team, and every year, everybody got a trophy. Everybody got the participation trophy. And I understand the, the thinking behind it is, that, well, you know, you did a good job. You finished the season. We want to make the kids feel good and feel important. But you didn't really win anything. All you did was show up. Look, I, I want to win prizes. You know, being born again, being a child of God, you're not winning anything. You received a free gift. You're going to heaven. But, but don't be fooled. There's no participation trophy at the judgment seat of Christ. Because your works are going to be tried by fire. And what you do that has eternal value, that's going to abide. If everything's get burned up, you know what your participation trophy is? You're getting, you still get to enter into heaven because it's not based on your works at all. But that's not really a trophy. You didn't earn it. It was given to you as a gift. A trophy is something that you earn, right? A prize, this, this reward that you receive is based, uh, is based on your works. That's why it has nothing to do with going to heaven it has to do with your works here that get judged that God will bless you with and reward you with once you get to heaven at the judgment seat of Christ. Let's not settle for mediocrity. And you know, this is something that I strive to push for, one, in my personal life, but two, also in the church. And it's important to understand this if you're going to understand our church because people might get a wrong idea even just with the spirit and stuff too. And, and, and a good example of this, let me explain it this way and, and you'll, you'll understand what I'm talking about. We do our preaching class roughly once a month with the guys. And anyone who's interested in preaching, they come here. And after they, they preach a sermon, I try to be as critical as possible on what they've said. And I just explained this to the guys last, last preaching class, but you know, a lot, oftentimes what I do in that class is I'll say things that if I heard that very same exact sermon preached like in church somewhere, I would never be criticizing the pastor or whoever, the preacher, whoever was preaching that, like someone just preached that same exact sermon. I'm not just going to be very critical of it unless there's just some, some blatant, you know, heresy or false doctrine or something. That's different. But no, I mean, that's not what I'm hearing in these preaching classes. But what I'm doing is I'm trying to train the guys to really think, to, to, to analyze everything that they're saying, to be careful on every single point, and to be prepared, and to, and to have everything 
ready to go. So when, when you get up and you preach before people, you're doing the best job that you possibly can. That you're not being sloppy, that you're thinking about what else might be going through people's minds and saying, well, if I say this, you know, what if someone else thinks, oh, well, that's not true because of this. You, you have to be able to answer all the questions so that you're not leaving any room for doubt, especially when you're trying to preach on, some, on, on something as important as doctrine from the Bible. It's an important job. So yeah, you know what I want to do? I want the guys that come through our church that I'm trying to train and help to become great preachers, I want to hold them to a high standard. I want to hold the people here. Why? Because if I just set the bar really low, there's not really much room for growth. If I just pat everyone on the back, hey, great job. Good job, good job, good job. Every time and just never give any type of criticism, anything to work on, then hey, everything's going good. This is one of the problems in general with a lot of Christian churches too, is that when, when you fail to preach on sin, when they fail to preach on areas that people need work on in their lives, and you just don't touch on that stuff, people think everything's just fine, everything's good. When you hear peace, peace all the time, it's just preaching on goodness, peace, love, that's all you hear. Well, what, what do I really need to work on? We need to have high standards. We need to set a bar for ourselves where we're pressing for a mark. We're pressing for, and you know, oftentimes people don't even realize what they're capable of unless they're pushed, unless they hold themselves to these high standards. That's why I like doing, you know, the challenges. Now, don't get me wrong. The challenges are meant to be challenges. They're not meant to be standards. Okay, a challenge is when you're pushing yourself above and beyond even what you know. A standard is something that's just, here's our baseline. Okay, this is where I am making sure we don't fall beneath this baseline. I'm setting my standard here. Well, everybody can set their standard at a different place. Right? I want my standard to already be very high. I don't want to catch myself slipping because when you start slipping, you start sliding. When you start sliding, you start backsliding and you start backsliding, it gains momentum and speed. You know, before you know it, you can be way, way off the mark. Amen. The high standard is, is, is there to help you. And it's, look, this is something that's personal. I'm not going to tell you what all of your standards should be. We are going to go through the scripture though this morning. I'm going to highlight just all kinds of different areas and just touch on them with just a verse here and a verse there on, on various subjects, all manner of aspects of our lives. And I'm not going to cover everything because there's no way you could cover everything in one sermon, but I'm just going to, I'm going to pinpoint just a lot of different areas for you to think about, for you to consider when you're making the decisions and the standards for your own life and how am I going to live? What, am, what is it that's going to be unacceptable for me? Because that's what the standard is. Saying, if I fall below the standard, that's unacceptable. I will not allow that. This is a standard that I'm going to hold myself to. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Well, let's see one more passage regarding just this, this concept or this mindset. Because there's nothing in Scripture that says you have to have high standards. It's just, it's just not there. And I try to preach biblical sermons. I think the concept is there. I think God wants us to have the spirit of, of obeying his commandments and, and doing so, you know, let, let everything you do, um, do, do, every, do it fervently as unto the Lord, right? Serve God fervently in your heart. And, and to me, it's just basic wisdom to have these things. But let's look at one more passage here in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I was, I was already starting to quote this earlier. Verse number 24. 1 Corinthians 9, 24. The Bible reads, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. And every, and every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now, what he's saying here is, like, don't you know that only one person really wins the prize? Yeah. If you're running a race... There's one winner. You get first place, second place, third place, fourth place, fifth place, sixth place, seventh place, eighth place, you know, all the way down to however many people run the race. Those are all the, the, the standing in the order. But you know what? There's one winner. 
There's one win. One person won that race. Not two, not three. One person wins. And he's explaining, you know, everybody's running, but one person receives the prize. One person wins. And he says, every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Anyone who's really serious about trying to win the prize says you need to be temperate in everything. What does it mean to be temperate? It means you're in control. You're, you're tempering yourself. You're, you're modulating your, your body. You're modulating your things. You're, you're able to control yourself. So the point of having standards is to control your, your behavior, your actions, you know, what you do. You're, you're setting a baseline there. You're setting a mark and saying, this is one mechanism to be temperate, to control myself. He says, um, now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. He's saying like, yeah, the people that run a race, they're just going to get some trophy or some medal or whatever. Yeah, that's going to be here today, gone tomorrow. That's, that's not a big deal. We're actually running to, to win an incorruptible crown. That's something that's going to last eternally. Amen. Way more valuable than anything you receive in this world physically is the reward that God will give you for running the race and winning the race. Now, look at verse number 26. It says, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly. So fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. He's saying, I bring my body into subjection. I'm the one in charge of my body. I'm the one in charge of the lust, what my body's going to do, what it's not going to do. And, and in order for me to win this race and to run this race and to be temperate, I need to be in control. We ought to have standards to reflect that control, to maintain that control, to keep us on the right path. Now, another thing that we ought to be doing here in church is, you know, the Bible says in Hebrews 10, we're not going to turn there, but that we, that we need to come together to provoke one another onto love and to good works. It, it's, it's encouragement. We're trying to be there for each other. So this is a team, right? Everyone's running their own individual race, but as a team, we're supportive of each other. We're trying to be there for you. Hey, keep going, man. Keep going strong. I know you got a cramp. I know you're getting winded. You know what? You're going to get a second win. Just keep pushing. Keep going. Don't quit. Oh, you stumbled. Here, let me help you up, brother. Come on. That's the point. Of, that's one of the reasons we have church at all. It's to look out for each other, to provoke one another into love and to good works. It's not just to pat everyone on the back and, hey, everything's going great. Now, look, if everything's going great, amen. But, you know, when someone's got, when, when someone's already stumbled and fallen, don't pat them on the back and say, good job. <laughs> Go over there and <laughs> help them up, right? Get them back in the race. Get them back to keep running. That's what we need to do. We don't want to be so loving where we just ignore that this person stumbled and fallen. Right. Or let's just pretend like it didn't happen. Good job. Look, just, just face it. Sometimes it's uncomfortable. You don't want to be worried about embarrassing the person that fell down, so let's all just look the other way. No, it happened. Let's just deal with it and say, hey, come on. You still do this. I'll help you up. Amen. Keep pushing forward. High standards. High standards are going to help to challenge you to push yourself. We don't want to ever let ourselves get too comfortable. If you have a standard set in your life where everything is just real easy and real smooth and smooth sailing and you've got no problems with, with any of your time management, with anything, I would say you might, you might not have the highest of standards. Because the higher you, you, you raise the bar for yourself, the harder it's going to be to try to keep those standards. So if everything's just easy street, it might be time to, to look at that a little bit and see if you can raise the bar. Amen. You know, this is something that, that, that's even a challenge for me just personally in my own life with my children in teaching them and homeschooling them. You know, I, I get a firsthand view of this and I'm going, you know, what's the point? Like, I don't care what the world standard is. 
And definitely when we're talking about our own standards just in general, we look at the Bible, and, and, and I'm going to get into this in a minute, but we talk about high standards. Really, the only reason why I'm even using the term high standards is because of the world. Because in the world's eyes, they're going to view these standards I'm referring to and talking about as being like, oh man, that's really high standard. A standard is it should just be a norm. That's a normal. That's what a standard is. It's, it's not a challenge. It's, it's just, hey, this is the normal, right. right? So even with my kids, this is what I was talking about. You know, I don't care what the world standard is on how educated they should be. That doesn't, that doesn't really mean much to me. I want to make sure that my kids have a good standard of what I expect for them to learn. I don't want them just being like, man, this is just so easy. And they're not really learning anything because they already know this stuff. Okay, so what if that's their, the, the, the curriculum for their age or whatever? If it's just boring to them, how, how is that a good standard for them? They're going to end up just thinking like, well, man, school's really boring. Which they shouldn't. Look, I thought school was boring, and I'm not saying that, that you're a bad person if you think school is boring. But it ought to be engaging, and, and when you're learning stuff, it ought to be fun. And as a parent, I, I try to, you know, it's not always the easiest thing to do, but you want to try to make it so that you know your children are improving and, and getting smarter and smarter. Like, I want my kids to be educated. I just preached a sermon one or two weeks ago on, you know, not being ignorant. Right, we want to increase our learning and our education. I tr strive to do that with my own children. I want them to learn. I want them to be smart. They say, yeah, but you've got, you've got three daughters. Yeah, I want them to be smart. I don't want anyone to be a dummy. Even if, even if they're, they're, you know, their life isn't going to take a direction of being a career person and, and being a CEO or anything, it doesn't matter. You don't have to be in particular positions to be smart. Everyone should have intelligence. And I want all my kids to have as much intelligence as I could possibly give to them. Wisdom is a principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And with all that getting, get understanding. Standards. I want them to have high standards. My standards. God's standards. My standards should be patterned off of God's standards. But I want my standards, you know, to be... Whatever the world is, doesn't matter to me. I'm going to look at this book and get my standards from this book. And think about it this way, too. If, if, I'm going to keep using the word high standard. Do you understand what I'm talking about? I already explained myself. If you set yourself to a really high standard, but you end up falling short, right? You, st you still find yourself kind of failing a standard. Isn't that still way better? If your standard's up here and you're kind of falling short, then if you set your standard down here and you're like, well, I'm meeting my standard all the time. Yeah. <laughs> you're doing way better to, to not quite hit and, and to fall a little bit short of the really high standard than you are just to be like, well, this is real comfortable. I'm just going to set it down here and I'm good enough to even think about it, worry about it because I could do that. No, let's set ourselves with a standard that, you know what? Obviously, you don't want to get discouraged, but, you know, God's standard is perfection. It, it is. God's standard for us is perfection. Because at the end of the day, there's no excuse for your sin. You have a will. You have a choice. I know we live in the flesh. God knows we live in the flesh. That's going to try to draw us to sin. But the, the culpability, the responsibility is still on us when we sin. God's standard has always been perfection. He knows we fall short of that, and he's extended his mercy and his grace unto us, which is why Jesus Christ came and died on the cross to pay for our sins. He's taken care of that, but the standard doesn't change. Again, you know, the world's going to say, oh, we have kids failing, and we want to make sure no kids left behind, so let's just lower our standards a little bit and make sure that everybody gets through. No. That's not the way God is. God hasn't changed his standard. His standard's still the same. Now, he's made an opportunity. Again, I mean, it's not, it's not a grading system with God because we all fail. But he's got a way for us still to, to not go to hell because we failed. 
but the standard hasn't changed. He hasn't lowered and dropped the standard. And we need to make sure we keep a high standard. Now, let's get into some standards of what should be normal for us. And then I'm going to go, I'm going to try to run through the gamut pretty quickly. Whatever we have time for, um, just, just all kinds of various things, sins, whatever in our life that we should be looking at. So, um, how about when it comes to drinking alcohol, drinking booze? What should our standard be? Some people say, well, you know, it's, it's obvious the Bible says you shouldn't be drunken, right? Drunkenness is a sin. I don't know any Christian that will argue with that. But then you say, well, what's the standard, right? You can say, well, what if I have a beer every month? Is that a sin? What if I, you know, well, you're not drunk, you're not a drunk, but what's the standard, right? And, and, and we have to look to the scripture and say, well, what is the standard going to be? And without preaching an entire sermon about alcohol, we've got an example of someone who had a good standard, and that's John the Baptist. John the Baptist had a good standard. In Luke 1.15, you have to turn our turf, you would to Ecclesiastes chapter 5. In Luke chapter 1, verse 15, the Bible says, for he shall be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. John the Baptist had a good standard and you know what resulted in that? He was filled with the Holy Ghost and he was great in the sight of the Lord and it's no mistake that the Bible fits in between those two statements. He's, he's not going to drink wine or strong drink. At all. At all. No drinking. You know what? That's a good standard to have. That's a standard I have. I think it's a biblical standard. And I don't think we should look at the Bible and say, well, drunkenness is a sin. So I'm going to go right here. And I'm going to try to get as close as I can to that line. And that's going to be my standard, just as long as I'm not getting drunk. We should look at that and look at all the serious warnings about booze and strong drink and drunkenness and go, I don't want to have anything to do with that. You know what? I'm just going to do like Proverbs says, look not thou upon the wine wizard. I'm not even going to look at it. I'm just going to just not even going to come close to it. Why would I want to fall down that death trap where my eyes are going to behold strange women and my heart's going to utter perverse things? I don't want to be anywhere near that. So let's just set a standard and go, yep, I won't even, I won't even walk down that aisle in the grocery store. Now, I'm not saying if you walk down the aisle in the grocery store that has alcohol on it, you're sinning. That's not what I'm teaching. But we're talking about having personal standards. I'm not saying you have to have this standard in order to come to this church. I'm not saying any of that. Look, this is all about what you do with your life. But I think we should strive to have high standards. Make up the standard for yourself. I'm just trying to share with you a little bit about how I think about these things and why I do based on Scripture. And again, I'm not going to be able to get in on all the details because every single one of these points is in the sermon in and of itself. So bear with me if I, if I fail to completely prove beyond a shadow of the doubt why my standard's right on each one of these topics. So uh, just do the study for yourself and come up with your own standard. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, look at verse number 4. The Bible says, When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it. For he hath no pleasure in fools. What is it saying? If you make a promise, if you make a vow and you don't pay it, you're a fool. You make a vow to God and you don't pay it, God has no pleasure in pools. Fools, pay that which thou hast vowed. Better is it that thou shouldest not vow than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin, neither say thou before the angel that it was an error. Wherefore should God be angry at thy voice and destroy the work of thine hands? How about keeping your word? Keeping your promise? When you say something, how about it actually means something? Don't be the one that's unfaithful, unreliable. Oh, well, Pastor Burson said this, but, well, you know how he is. 
Who knows if it'll really happen? Who knows if it'll really... No. Look, when you say something, when you vow something, when you make a promise, that's, that's why I'm really careful not to promise about the prizes <laughs> for our memory challenges. <laughs> because I don't want to make a vow and make a promise and defer not to pay it. Now, I did make the promise that next week I will have them. So you watch. Okay? I'll have them by next week. I want my words to mean something. I want you to be able to hear what I say. And you know what? Everyone, you, you, ought to, you ought to care about your words so that people will treat what you say with respect of saying, well, hey, if so-and-so said it, I'll believe that. Because ultimately, this is going to impact your testimony when you're trying to lead somebody to Christ. If you're already known to be someone who's a liar, you're already known to be someone who's just completely unfaithful, oh yeah, they said this, whatever. Why is anyone going to take anything that you say seriously? Just like Lot. He seemed to his own family as one that mocked. He's just making jokes like, oh yeah, Lot's talking about this destruction and doom and gloom and stuff. Yeah, right. They didn't take anything he had to say seriously. Why? He didn't have a good testimony up to that point. At all. Very poor testimony. How about keeping your word in marriage? How about when you make a vow that says, for better or for worse? Amen. Nobody needs the vow. No one cares about the vow for better. I mean, what, why, would you, why would you not stay together when things are going great and on the up and up? You know, I'm going to stay with you for better, for richer, in health. That's not the way the vows go. When everything's going great and we have no arguments, we're staying together, baby. You and me. Till death. No. It's for, for richer, for poorer. In sickness and in health. Better and worse. You make the vow... Because you're saying that when times get really rough and really bad, I still won't leave you. What is wrong with people today that end up leaving when things get rough? Amen. It's too hard. Well, you don't understand. Well, you know what? I understand what the Bible says. Amen. You don't understand how he doesn't love me. You don't understand. He's, look, this is the standard. This is the standard. You don't make the vow saying you're willing to go through hard times and still stay with that person. And then when hard times come, say, oh, I didn't really mean it. Right. We're just going to get a divorce as if we're some boyfriend and girlfriend. I guess break up with you and I'm going to go and be with somebody else now. That's not God's standard. Amen. That's not the standard I want to hold myself to. And that's not the standard I'm going to teach my children either. Amen. You take your word seriously. First Corinthians chapter six. You know, I was just talking about marriage. How about just dating or fornication? And this is, this is a subject, adultery, fornication, things like this. The Bible has a lot to say about these sins. A lot to say about these sins. Yeah, I mean, there's multiple sermons you can teach on this one subject. So again, bear with me. But we're talking about standards, right? How about having a standard? How about a standing of, a standard of when you get married, you don't get divorced? I think that's a good standard. How about having a standard... Of, like in 1 Corinthians 6, 18, the Bible says, flee fornication. Not, get, get far, 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 far away from it. So if we want to flee fornication and make sure you're, you're, you're far from it, okay, the standard is, if you want to set the standard of just, well, I'm just not going to sin at all. I'm not going to fornicate. But you're, you're setting yourself up because of your standards but, you know, I'm dating this person and we're going to go and hang out in his bedroom when his parents aren't home and no one's around and, you know, uh, that's fine and, and, I'll, and that's okay and we'll just go ahead and do that. 
and you're just setting yourself up just as close as you can. But we're not going to fornicate. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna allow for every other situation to just be, to fall into place to where, well, if we have, if we have a, a hard time, then we'll be able to, to do it. No. The standard should be we're only going to be in public settings with chaperones. We're going to, we're going to, you know, oh, that sounds so old fashioned. And, you know, you're an old fuddy duddy. You know what? I want to have high standards because I respect God's laws. And I know how damaging this can be. It's not just some, oh, no big deal. Oh, you know, all your kids, you know, the, the youth just need to sow their wild oats before they finally settle down. Look, that's not the way life should be. That's not the way God intended it to be. And we need to keep high standards to keep ourselves away, as far away from these sins as possible. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6, 18, flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. The commandment says don't fornicate. The commandment says don't commit adultery. The spirit of the commandment saying, don't you know even what your body is? When you start to understand, first of all, your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. Well, how are you going to treat the temple of the Holy Ghost? That's so much even above just you in general. Wow, this is housing the Holy Ghost. Not just that, I was bought, my body was bought with a price. What was that price? Oh, the blood of Jesus Christ? The only begotten Son of God? Yeah, we've preached about that last week. We talk about the love of God. That huge price was for actually bought your body, which now doesn't belong to you anymore. Maybe I should rethink my standards to keep something so precious and pure and holy as God wants it to be. Look, I know my body is not pure, but it's the temple of the Holy Ghost. Shouldn't I be striving to keep my body as pure as I possibly can? Yeah. Just, just knowing that, knowing that alone, And this, you take all kinds of directions. Obviously, in the context, we're referring to fornication, but, I mean, how about, how about ingesting, you know, harmful smoke or drugs or, or booze or whatever, things that just destroy your body? Even just being gluttonous and just indulging and overeating and bringing all, all manner of disease upon yourself. Look, it's the temple of the Holy Ghost. Let's keep a high standard. Uh, and obviously, you know, <clears throat> fornication is very similar to adultery. But how about these standards? Because I, I want to try to throw out some standards for you to be thinking about. We know what we want to stay away from. How do we stay away from them? We stay away by setting standards. You know, one of the standards that I set is that neither myself nor my wife will be found traveling alone with someone of the opposite gender unless they're an immediate family member. You know, obviously, if she's driving somewhere with her brother, that's fine. Amen. But she's not going to go with any of the guys in his church or any of the guys in my work or anyone else and just go on some car ride and go out to lunch and go hang out and spend some time together. Oh, why, Pastor Burns, you don't trust your wife? It has nothing to do with trust. It has to do with we're holding ourselves to standards. That if we continue to live by these standards, you know what? The adultery and the divorce is going to be that much farther away from, from being a reality. <clears throat> Most people don't just commit adultery like you bump into someone on the street and go, oh, okay, let's just commit adultery now. That's not how it works. People build relationships. People spend time together. And, and, and that's why, you know, even in, in church, just so you're aware of this, ladies, if you ask for counsel, if you want help, if you're married, your husband's going to be involved. Amen. And if you're not married, my wife is going to be there. 
That's just the way it is. Because I, I'm trying to hold a standard to keep everything on the up and up. There's, there's so many things that you should look in your life and say, this is going to be a, you know, another word for standard is a rule. There's a rule in our house. There's a rule I'm setting for myself. I don't want to break that rule. That's why I put the rule in place. And I want the rules to make sense to keep me having a good standard with the Lord that, that will keep me away from all these sins and from falling short. <clears throat> How about, how about even uh, um, a standard from our memory, our memory verse? Deuteronomy chapter 6. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. How about raising your children and teaching them the scripture and taking it upon yourself to make it a rule and saying, I'm going to make sure my kids know the Bible. Amen. And notice, this doesn't say about teaching your children diligently by dropping them off in Sunday school and dropping them off at church. This says you diligently teach your children. Yeah, bring them to church with you. But how about you take the time? Because you know what? We don't have church when we lie down and when we wake up and when we're walking by the way. We're not having church at those times. We're having church right now. But when you're diligently teaching your children, the Bible says, teach them when you're sitting in your house and when you're walking by the way and when you're lying down to, to go to bed at night and then when you wake up in the morning. And you, you know what he's saying? Obviously, you could have kept going on and on and on and on and on. But the point is, you really need to be diligent about teaching this to your children. And that every time is a good time. Every time is a good opportunity. And, and, and make sure this is a priority for you. So why don't you set a standard to do that? Set up a new rule. Here's what I'm going to teach my children. I'm going to make sure that I do this. So I'm going to set a standard of, I'm going to teach my children every night. I don't care what happens. Or every morning. Or every morning and night. Whatever. You know, set yourself up with a rule. To say, I'm going to make sure they're getting teaching. They're getting instruction. Now obviously this is in context talking about the commandments of the Lord. But how about just teaching them because with, with, with obviously with that, but with, with everything they need to know. You need to decide what's acceptable for you. Is it acceptable to look at a verse like this and then have a standard of just dropping them off and I'm going to let someone else teach them and raise them? Whether that be the church doing it or whether it be a public school or whoever else just saying well I know that the Bible says that I need to be diligently teaching my children so here's how I'm diligent about it you do it I'm diligent because I make sure that they get there every day that's not the way I read that look you read it how you want to read it that's between you and God I don't see that I think that we are responsible as parents when God has blessed you with a child that you're responsible for raising them. You're responsible for teaching them. You're responsible. That's why, you know, you saw in the bulletin, we do homeschool field trips because I believe in homeschooling. Because I think that when God's given you children, he expects you to teach them and to raise them and not let someone else do it. Right. We live in a, in a fallen world. We live in a wicked world. Amen. I get that. And I get there's, there's certain situations that people just happen to find themselves in that maybe that's not an option for them. But I'm talking about standards. I'm not talking about what should be exceptions. We're talking about standards. <clears throat> when you're raising your children, how about having a standard of disciplining them as well? I don't know about you, but it's not acceptable for me for my kids to be throwing a fit out in public. Amen. You go to a grocery store, or you go to a restaurant, or you go to church, and they're just going to throw themselves on the ground and just start screaming and wailing. You know, that's not acceptable for me. The Bible says that foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. We expect kids to do foolish things. Of course they do. It's bound in the heart of a child, but we don't just say, okay, then just continue being a fool. 
Because then they're going to grow up to be a fool. That's why the verse doesn't end there. It says, Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. That's why I use the rod of correction. To drive that foolishness away. That's why when you see parents who institute God's word in their rearing of the children, you're not going to see the kid throwing the fit in the grocery store and not listening and respecting the word of their mother or the word of their father. Because the, the, the parent that uses God's methods of disciplining their children, they're going to listen and they're going to hear and they're, they're going to do. That's what the rod of correction does. First-hand testimony, I'll tell you that works. It's worked with every single one of my five children. They don't like that rod. So when they start misbehaving, they know what's going to come. And that is a real quick attitude adjustment. That's why you won't find them throwing the fits on the ground. I'm not saying something like that never happens because foolishness is bound in the heart of the child. But when it happens, you need to drive it far, far away so that when those events happen, they're very few and far between. Standards. But what's your standard? What's acceptable for you? How about the entertainment, music, movies, whatever it is that you choose to spend your time doing just to relax and enjoy yourself? Well, the Bible says that the friendship with the world is, is to be at enmity with God. And in Romans 1.32, of course, Romans 1 goes through this whole list of these reprobates that are full of all manner of sin. And, and you could go down the list and it's just full of all kinds of just evil things. And then at the very end of the chapter, it says in verse 32, Who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. I don't know about you, but when there's wicked people, and the Bible talks about these wicked people that are worthy of death based on their actions, and they're just full of all manner of sin, they hate God, they have nothing to do with God, I'm not going to take my pleasure in those people and in what they do and in what they promote and what they're putting out on the big screen and what they're putting out on the radio. I have nothing to do with them. I don't want to take pleasure in that, so I'm going to have a standard that says, you know what, I might even go as far as to say no TV. Right. We don't have the cable television and, the, and whatever else. Now, we actually have the apparatus of the screen to be able to put whatever I want to put on there that I have control of to come out on the image on that screen. Thank you. But we don't, uh, you know, we're, we're not just going to let all the world's filth into our house. <clears throat> yeah, there's no way we get to all this. <laughs> I'm going to skip a few for sake of time. How about working? Standards in working. Bible says, six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. Setting a standard of working. That's not the world standard. What's the world standard? 40 hours a week, all this paid off time and all this other stuff. And then, and then once you do that, that's all the work you have to do. It's not the way we see it in the Bible. You know, people are working full days. They're working 12-hour shifts. They're working full time. They're working six days. It's, you know, it's good to work. Let's have a standard, especially if you're going to be a Christian, you're going to be a believer. Why don't you be the guy on the job that's not saying, oh, it's Monday. Oh, well, at least it's Friday now. I could just blow off and not do any work. And, and, and as soon as the time's you know, off, like I'm out of here. Look, be a worker. Be someone who wants to work. Hold yourself to a high standard. The Bible says in... Um, <clears throat> Well, first of all, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10, For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. That's a biblical standard. Amen. When someone's capable of working, when someone's an able-bodied person, and they don't want to work, well, I don't want to go to work. Well, I guess you don't want to eat then. Because I know I'm not going to give you any food. Oh, well, I thought, I thought you're, you know, you're supposed to be loving and caring. Look, if you have an able-bodied person that's capable of working, that doesn't want to work, and just wants to get a handout, 
You're not going to eat. Amen. At least not for me. Some other, some other fool might just go ahead and give you their hard-earned money that you don't want to work for, that you just expect a handout. I'm not going to do it. And as a believer, as someone who believes the Bible, you're able to work. Get to work. Men, be providing for your families. Be working hard to make sure they're cared for. And women need to be watching over the home and working hard there. It doesn't mean you're working for someone else. You work for your husband. Amen. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 3, verse 22, Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. What that's saying is, you know, you don't do it only when the boss is looking. It's not just with eye service as men pleasers, like, oh, well, the boss is coming. I better make sure I look real busy. And the boss walks away and then you get back on your phone and you're just, you know, wasting your time on the job. That's wicked. I don't care if everyone else at your job's doing it. You shouldn't do it. Why don't you hold yourself to a higher standard? Amen. Why don't you be the one that's just going to do your work? Do the job because what the Bible says, and whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. That's who you're serving. When you're working at your job, why don't you work as if you're working for Jesus? And that's the level of effort you need to put in. And don't hold back. And don't have the attitude going, well, you're only going to pay me this much, and I'm only going to give you this much. Look, you just work. Don't worry about how much you're getting paid. You know what? God will bless you. God will see your work. Why don't you have faith that God will see your work and he'll bless you? <clears throat> I mentioned ladies too working. Proverbs 31 talks about the virtuous woman. Proverbs 31 talks about the lady who rises also while it is yet night and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maidens. She's waking up before dawn to make sure that her house is taken care of. And not only that, she's staying up late. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good. Her candle goeth not out by night. She's getting up early. She's staying, out, staying up late and getting all manner of work done at the home. That's a hardworking woman. That's a virtuous woman. And again, an entire sermon on its own. We talk about how the Bible talks about how we should be working. We should be laboring. We are servants. We should be working hard, working for the Lord. Absolutely, yes. But even just working in whatever you do, you're a servant. You've got a master. You've got a boss. Work for him. Work hard. Give him an effort. <clears throat> All right, last standard when it comes to just sin, sinful things kind of in general, our appearance. And I'm not going to get too far in everything, but there's one point I wanted to make because it's already the middle of summer, and I don't think I've touched on this at all in a long time. But the Bible gives us a standard of covering our nakedness and what it means to be naked. The world has their own standard. The world's going to tell you that on a lady, little pieces of cloth, just a few little pieces, are enough, if they're over your body, to be considered not naked. That's not God's standard. That is not the biblical standard at all. I'll tell you that right now. The world standard, by God's standard, there are people walking around naked every day. Every day. And there's a much higher percentage of naked people hanging out at the beach and at the public pools because they're wearing things that look like underwear or even less than underwear just out in public. But you know what? Socially, it's acceptable. But it's not acceptable by God's standard. You know what? God's definition of nakedness, if you want to know what it is, well, 
Again, I'm not going to preach an entire sermon, but Exodus 28. In Exodus 28, we get a good example of what a priest is wearing in order to cover his nakedness. So the Bible is saying, here's something that he wore in order to cover his nakedness. And by looking at that, we can see, oh, okay, well, if this is what's covering nakedness, then if I'm not wearing something that covers at least this much, then I'm definitely naked because my nakedness isn't all covered. Exodus 28, verse number 42. Yeah, and I know, look, this is one of those boring chapters that talks about the priest and talks about the sacrifices. It talks about, oh, there's all this stuff in the temple that you don't want to read and you just skip over it because you just want to read the stuff that sounds interesting to you and you're missing over and passing over good doctrine. Why don't you read all the Bible? Amen. Exodus 28, verse 42. And thou shalt make them linen breeches to cover their nakedness. From the loins, even unto the thighs, shall they reach. You know what that's saying? If your thighs are exposed, your nakedness is exposed. Is, is, that, is that not what this is saying? They wore garments from the loins to the thighs in order to cover their nakedness. What standard do you want to have? I want to have a standard that's not going to be called nakedness in God's eyes. Amen. I don't care how many people are naked. I don't want to join in the nakedness and go, okay, well, if you're all doing it, then I'm going to do it too. Right. And I don't care what the world thinks. You know, we have, we have swim dresses for my, for my girls to wear when we, go, when we go swimming. I don't care if people think that looks goofy or silly or funny. It doesn't matter to me. But you know what? There's really not a whole lot of times for that either because if we're going to go somewhere and go swimming, I'm all, I also have another standard, and this ties in not just with the nakedness, but with other commandments. With how about we're going through the study of Matthew where Jesus says, you know, if you look after a woman to lust after her in her heart, you've committed adultery with her already. Well, I see in the Bible where Job made a covenant with his eyes. How then shall I think upon a mate? Men, you want to make sure that you're not lusting after a woman? Why don't you make sure that you're not putting naked women in front of your eyes? And I'm not just talking about the pornography on the internet. Of course you shouldn't be putting that filth in front of your eyes. But how about not going down to the public pool when you know there's going to be ladies dressed in bikinis down there and they're exposing their nakedness in front of you. How about you don't even look at that so you don't commit adultery in your heart against your wife? Don't you love your wife? Don't you love God? How about you hold that standard and just stay away from it altogether? Right. You don't have to be there. You don't have to be part of that. So what if it means you, you miss a little bit of swimming? Who cares? Why don't you hold a high standard for yourself? You call me nuts, but you know what? I want to make sure I love my wife and, you know, the, the adultery starts in the mind and in the heart. Amen. And it's going to start there before it ever gets into action. You want to keep that as far away from you as possible. I don't want my life destroyed. I don't. How about other standards? I, I'm, I'm out of time. Non-sinful things. Bible reading. Set a standard for yourself. God's Word doesn't tell you exactly how much you need to read for, you know, to hear from God, for not to be sin. The Bible's not going to tell you these things. You need to come up with your own standards. I would look at the spirit of, hey, this is God's Word. There's a lot of time I could spend reading man's Word, but this is God's Word. How important is that? How important is this instruction? Well, how much of that do you want in your life? What standard are you going to set for yourself to make sure, you know what, I'm making sure I'm getting this input because I'm getting input from all over the place all the time. I need to make sure this is coming into my mind on a regular basis, so I'm going to set a standard for myself. 
I have a standard for our family of making sure we get through the Bible once every year. And it's a pretty low standard, I'll admit. I do other reading and other things on my own with on my own time, but this is just me making sure that my whole family gets to hear the Bible at least once every year. That's my personal standard. Come up with your own standard. But have a standard. And have a standard that's going to that's going to, you know, that you feel is going to push you enough to just not be comfortable. Cuz you know what when you have the standard, then you're not going Eh, well, we're just not going to read. Oh, well, we're just not going to hear from God today. No, that's the standard. We need to do this. I don't want to fail at this. Soul winning. Preaching the gospel. Again, the Bible doesn't tell you how much you have to do that, you know, this many, this many minutes a day or, or a week or a month or whatever. But why don't you set a standard for yourself to make sure that you don't get into the habit of just not even going at all? And just set it as a standard for yourself and say, I'm going to make sure I go soul winning. I make sure I go soul winning every single week. Every single week. I, I, don't, I, I cannot fail from going soul winning. I mean, definitely not as a pastor, but, but even just as a believer. I have to go soul winning. I have to. That's, just, that's, that's my standard. I have to. It's not acceptable to say I'm not going to go. Now, the amount of time you set for yourself may vary, but look, set a standard for yourself. Church attendance. How important is it? What's the standard going to be? Once a week, twice a week, three times a week, once a month. Look, set a standard for yourself. Use it based on biblical principles. How important is church? How important do you think it is to you? Prayer. Look, all of these things are important to have standards on. And, I, and I'm, I'm, there's so much to say when it comes to this, but I'll just, I'll wrap it all up. Because there's two types of attitudes that you could have, and I'm going to close with this. Two types of attitudes. One attitude is like where Jesus said in Matthew 19, and you don't have to turn there, but he basically talks about, um, he says, whosoever shall put away his wife except it be for fornication and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away doth commit adultery. He's talking about a standard of marriage and no divorce and saying look you put your wife away you divorce your wife then you're committing adultery and his disciples say to him if the case of the man be so with his wife it's not good to marry then we say well then I mean hey if we can't just divorce our wives it's not good to marry that's not the right attitude to have how about an attitude of saying um, like Jesus had in Matthew 5, you have heard that it was said to them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Let's embrace God's laws. Let's embrace his commandments and not say, oh, well, then it's just not even good. No, it is good. But let's set our standards even higher then to make sure that we're going to follow and obey and say, okay, no, it is good. You know, to him that findeth a wife is a good thing. It's a good thing to find a wife. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing to get married. But let's make sure that we're not going and divorcing our wife. How about that? How about have that attitude and set a standard of saying, well, I'm just not going to let that happen at all because Jesus Christ spoke so severely about the opposite. So I'm going I'm to bring myself the other way to make sure that doesn't happen. That's the standard I want to have. So... You know, I said before, my standards, they may not be your standards. And that's fine. Come up with your own standards. But have something. Have a standard. Don't just go off of the world's standards. Use God's word to provide you with your own standards. And set them that you're pushing yourself. Just set it so that you're making sure you're not just getting too comfortable. Because we don't want to fall into the backsliding. Let's keep pushing forward. Let's bow our that word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for all the instruction that you've given to us, your creation, dear Lord. We thank you for that. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for dying for us. We thank you for providing us with all this information. Lord, I pray that you would please help, help us as we do have this sinful flesh and we do live in this body, dear Lord, that you would help us to overcome this flesh and help our, our spirits to be strengthened, that we could walk in the spirit and that we could feed our spirit and help the spirit to grow so that we could overcome the flesh. Dear Lord, um, help us all to, to take these things seriously and take them to heart and that all the decisions that we make will be based off of your word. Lord, help us to set good standards in our life that we would make sure we would keep ourselves 
from falling. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.